It's the 16th of October, 2009. In the east of Berlin, the newly restored Neues Museum is about to reopen. The museum houses the finest collection of Egyptian artifacts in Germany. But the biggest draw is the arrival of one of Egypt's most famous queens, the bust of Nefertiti. It's a masterpiece that had been on display in the old museum in Berlin for 20 years. Now, Nefertiti is moving homes to become the star attraction in the Neues Museum. I think it's an absolute masterpiece and certainly timeless. It really is perfection and full of aesthetic value. One sees the perfect beauty. Where does it come from? Her life made her a star. It's a little like the Mona Lisa. It is the icon of the Egyptian identity. Nefertiti is over 3,000 years old. Tremendous care is taken to ensure no damage is done to the flawless face. That she is in such good condition is one of the enigmas in the history of archaeological discoveries. But the party is spoilt by some news from Geneva that is widely reported in the media that the bust of Nefertiti is a fake. The controversial claim comes after a 20-year-long inquiry conducted by author and historian Henri Sterlin. I have no doubt in my mind that this is a fake, a copy, a phony, or a model. What first made the academic suspicious was the exceptional state of conservation of Nefertiti's bust when it was discovered. The object was incongruous, it bore no resemblance to any other 3,000, 300-year-old busts from Egypt. To historian Henri Sterlin, the bust of Nefertiti is simply too well-preserved, or, as he puts it, too new to be true. Then there is a second bust found lying alongside that of Nefertiti. It's a bust of her husband, the pharaoh Akhenaton, and it's completely disfigured. Why should there be such a difference in the condition of the busts, which were found at the same time, at the same place? So is Nefertiti a fake? In Montpellier in southern France, archaeologist and Egyptologist Marc Gabold, who is also an expert on Nefertiti, considers Sterlin's claims. If I have to say he was right to ask the question, but the arguments he's provided aren't necessarily sufficient. If he can give me some strong scientific arguments that it is a forgery, then I would accept it. There's certainly some doubts. In the basements of the Neues Museum in Berlin, a news conference is being held. The journalists are taking notes, but there are no questions about the charges of authenticity. In Germany, such accusations are considered taboo. Because the bust, discovered a century ago in Egypt by German archaeologist Ludwig Borchardt, has now become a symbol in Germany. Nevertheless, we did ask the question to Neues Museum director Frederike Seyfried. When you stand before the bust, the question never even enters your mind. It goes without saying it's authentic. The real question is, why would it be a fake? Numerous archaeologists, Americans, Italians, French, have expressed their doubts about whether the bust is genuine, but none of them have made their doubts official. So we've decided to stage our own inquiry. You see, everyone's being very circumspect. No one has dared come right out and openly declare the object to be a fake. So is the most famous bust of ancient Egypt a phony? To find out, we met with the greatest experts, subjected the bust to a lie detector and retraced history. What we uncovered during our inquiry will forever change your opinion about Egypt's most mysterious queen and her likeness, the bust of Nefertiti. Who was Nefertiti? It's one of the great mysteries of Egypt's pharaonic past. Generations of archaeologists have scoured through all the monuments, 
gone through each hieroglyphic on each column and temple wall in an attempt to find the slightest evidence of her existence. Archaeologists went up the Nile as far as Karnak, searching one of the country's largest religious centers for any traces of Queen Nefertiti. In this labyrinth of columns and temples, they finally found the first image of the queen. It was chiseled directly into a stone from a now lost temple. But nothing is known of Nefertiti's origins. She was probably Egyptian, almost certainly the wife of the famous 18th dynasty pharaoh, the great Akhenaton. Nefertiti was the principal wife of Akhenaton. She was the only one who had the right to the title Great Spouse of the King. We know the Queen's sisters, and we know of her nurse, but we know nothing about the origins of Nefertiti's family. To be honest, I'd have to say we don't know. She's the Queen of Egypt, of whom we have the most representations and documents, but also the one of whom we know the least. It's not known who Nefertiti's parents were, but what's striking is her remarkable beauty, with a face that at first appears so contemporary. It's thanks to her husband, Akhenaton, the heretic and rebel, that her name has survived. The pharaoh has gone down in history for having imposed Aton, the sun god, as the only deity and getting rid of the rest of the many Egyptian gods. During his reign in the 18th dynasty, Akhenaton has new temples built, many of them open to the skies, to allow the sun's beneficial rays to shine through. In his new religion, Akhenaton develops a cult of the personality, as he and the sun god gradually become the same being. Nefertiti and Akhenaten were also the most romantic of all the pharaonic couples. Their love for each other began at a very young age. On these statuaries, their age is given as 14. For the first time, the people witnessed two adolescents, masters of an empire, holding hands. They are portrayed as being very much in love. All the more astonishing are the images of the king and queen embracing. They are depicted on the royal chariot and Akhenaton is kissing Nefertiti. The queen is shown placing a necklace around the king's neck and he seizes the moment to give her a peck on the cheek. It's a very intimate moment and must reflect a true love story. In the seventh year of their reign, Akhenaton and Nefertiti relocate from Karnak and set up at Tel El Amana in the middle of the desert. There they build a new royal city they call Akhet Aton, which means the sun's horizon. The most famous couple in the history of Egypt lived in a modern city that was built quickly with space for 50,000 inhabitants a city dotted with temples that had no roofs. Akhenaten and Nefertiti spend much of their time worshipping the sun god. But the reign of Akhenaten and Nefertiti will last only 17 years. After their deaths, their successors will destroy all trace of their existence and dismantle the palaces brick by brick. In less than 30 years, the city will disappear back into the desert. You might say it's the Pompeii of the sands. When you dig through the buildings from the 18th dynasty, the only time they were occupied was during the era of Akhenaton, so just over 15 years. And it gives one a real snapshot of life in Egypt back then. It was in this 5 by 10 kilometer rectangle of desert that on the 6th of December 1912, the bust of Nefertiti emerged whole from the middle of nowhere. Ludwig Borchardt was born in Berlin in 1863. He became the most famous archaeologist of his day. Egypt, its monuments and architecture fascinated Borchardt. 
In 1906, the German archaeologist organizes a dig in the remains of Akhenaten City, a ghost town according to some, but the site of a terrible act of vandalism to the archaeologists. Borchardt is a real sleuth and is persuaded he'll make the discovery of the century, and on the 6th of December 1912, surrounded by his team, he will uncover the find of a lifetime, the celebrated bust of Nefertiti. The statuette, carved from limestone, was found just 50 centimeters below some gravel. Borchardt has resurrected a remarkably lifelike and technicolor queen. But how did archaeologist Borchardt make this masterpiece appear out of nowhere? Before the arrival of the German, Akhenaten's ancient city had been the virtual preserve of the British and their chief archaeologist, Sir Flinders Petrie who had led major excavations on the site in 1891 and 1892. They had opened tombs, unearthed the magnificent frescoes of senior officials, and uncovered the foundations of palaces. But they had never come across anything like the magnificent bust of Nefertiti. So when Borchardt's archaeological expedition showed up, it made the British sneer. They're convinced the German will find absolutely nothing. Flinders Petrie was already there. He stopped, I think, at the end of the 19th century working in Tel Alamana, and for him, he was through. Uh, he had the idea, it is done, and nobody has to, there's nothing to find anymore. But, I mean, as we know, this was not true. <laughs> Borchardt, he came to Amana initially because he saw it as a major source of information on domestic architecture. But at the back of his mind was the fact that he had close connections with the Berlin Museum and he rather wanted something spectacular to bring back to Berlin. At the beginning of the 20th century, Egypt was the world's largest hunting ground for archaeologists. Prussia had lagged behind in the race for treasures. Kaiser William ordered Borchardt to return with a trophy, whatever the cost. Before excavations begin, the clever archaeologist seeks the advice of Cairo's leading antiquarians, many of whom do business with looters. He's told that part of Akhenaten's ancient city has yet to be excavated. Borchardt is also an architect, and before arriving, he'd drawn up floor plans for the southeast sector, once inhabited by artisans, but untouched by both the British and the looters. He's interested in housing, so he starts by digging through the larger villas. These can be distinguished on the site by the small mounds. Later, he extends the dig to include all the houses. And by an extraordinary stroke of luck, he uncovers the offices and the house of the sculptor Thutmosis, one of the highlights of its excavations. Borchardt soon realizes he's come across a property that includes several sculptors' studios. Excited, the archaeologist decides to dig through every square inch of the gardens. And behind the silos, he identifies the house of the senior craftsman, Thutmosis, the personal sculptor of Akhenaton and Nefertiti. And it was here that Borchardt is said to have found the bust. Intrigued, we retrace the steps one century later of archaeologist Ludwig Borchardt and search out the house where the bust was discovered. Tel El Amana is a five-hour drive south of Cairo, Akhenaton and Nefertiti's ghost town. Joining us is Luc Vetrin, an expert in ancient Egyptian works of art who is employed by the courts to identify forged pieces. Egyptian archaeologist Amada is the inspector general of the dig at Tel El Amana. Well, here, as you can see, is Borchardt's report on the excavation. As you can see, this is the official report made after the excavation by Borchardt. And there is not a lot of things which don't send directly. Luc Vatrin has an exceptional document, the notes and sketches of archaeologist Ludwig Borchardt, in which he writes extensively of his discovery of the bust in 1912. The document will prove invaluable in tracing the exact spot where Nefertiti's bust was uncovered.
Look, Patrick, now we arrived to yes. the house of Tohotmos. This is a very important house, which is defined the which work hard in 6 December 1912 to find the past of Nefertiti, which now is part of the museum. This is what remains 3,300 years later of the studio of Thutmosis, the chief sculptor. It's in one of these rooms at Borschat, the German archaeologist reportedly found the bust. With a map, archaeologist Luc Vatrin interprets the site. Alors là, effectivement, now, this is quite moving, moving because this is the villa's reception room. It's almost certain that this is where the owner would have entertained his special guests, senior officials, and why not? Queen Nefertiti herself. If you leave the room in that direction, here we get to the sculptor's studio. And behind the door, and Borchardt's notes are very precise about this, it's right here in this corner that he found the bust of the queen. So according to Borchardt, Nefertiti was here buried for more than 3,200 years, yet still so realistic. But that's not all, because the house of Akhenaton's senior sculptor turns out to be filled with treasures. Borchardt discovers other pieces, the finest collection of busts from the period, plaster masks, strangely lifelike, and models of studios like Akhenaton's. A model that's incomplete, and the famous bust of Akhenaton himself found lying next to Nefertiti's. Ludwig Borchardt donates all his finest trophies to the museum in Berlin. But in all this archaeological fairy tale, there's one detail that grabs the attention of a historian. It's an element that will spark an investigation worthy of a detective novel. In his colonial-style house in Cairo, Ludwig Borchardt will take more than 10 years before he publishes the complete report on his digs at Tel al-Amana. He tells how he found the limestone bust of Nefertiti, and another bust also in limestone found alongside of the pharaoh Akhenaton, its face ripped apart. In his topographical notes, Borchardt takes great care to note the location of the bust of Nefertiti. He also marked where the disfigured bust of Akhenaton had been found. According to his drawings, the bust of Nefertiti was on a shelf in a corner of the studio. The bust of Akhenaton was the first to be found on the floor near the entrance to the left. But the passage of time caused the outer wall to crumble and the bust of Nefertiti with it. Akhenaton's bust was found in several pieces, while strangely, Nefertiti's was intact, almost as if it had just left the sculptor's studio. The whole story was pure deception made up by Borchardt. That was the conclusion of Swiss historian Henri Sterlin, who had investigated the case for 20 years. He questions Borchardt's report and concludes that Nefertiti was, quote, simply too beautiful to be authentic. How is it possible that such a heavy object, that such a delicate object, so finely painted, could have fallen like Borchardt claims from a shelf, about a meter and a half from the floor onto stones and rubble, without being damaged, especially since he claims it fell face down? And then he says it's such a delicate object. I mean, it's hardly possible that only the ears were damaged. And besides, the ears wouldn't even have hit the floor when the object fell. When his inquiry began in 1984, Henri Sterlin expressed his doubts to Dietrich Wildung, one of the greatest German archaeologists, and beyond all reproach, at the time, the director of the museum in Munich. Wildung had studied the bus for many years and shared Stirland's doubts. He had written a letter to Stirland. Well, in the letter that he wrote, he said, my project was valid and persuasive. And here, let me quote you word for word. 
He writes, ist sehr schlüssig und überzeugend. In other words, convincing and coherent. In the letter, Dieter Wildung also admits to his own suspicions about the state of conservation of the Nefertiti bust, and that its style was not consistent with the Akhenaton period, and that he was even willing to write the introduction to his report. Then in 1989, he's named the curator of the bust of Nefertiti, and makes a dramatic U-turn. And then Wildung suddenly sends me another letter, in which he says he's been named the director of the Berlin Museum, where the Nefertiti bust is housed. And the whole issue has now taken on a different meaning, and that he was distancing himself from the inquiry and therefore could no longer get involved. But to me, the most worrying thing was when two representatives came down from Berlin to persuade me to stop my research. Historian Henri Sterlin is not someone who is easily intimidated and will continue his relentless investigation, albeit now totally isolated. Fascinated by the story, we head back to Berlin for a meeting with Dietrich Wildung. On the eve of our interview, the archaeological expert decides to cancel. We call back pretending we haven't received his message. Hello, Hello Wildung here. Oui, Monsieur Dietrich Mr. Dietrich Wildung? Yes. Je vous parce que nous I'm calling because we have a meeting arranged for tomorrow about uh, Nefertiti. Nefertiti. And I wanted to know what time we can get together. I sent an email out today in which I absolutely refuse to talk about that object. Otherwise, I might have serious difficulties. We'll later learn that the German authorities have formally forbidden Herr Wildung to talk about Nefertiti's bust or to mention Henri Sterlin's research. To the historian, the bust of Nefertiti was the result of an experiment. Borchardt had a copy of the bust made because he wanted to examine sculpting techniques on plaster, and in particular how the Egyptians had used color. In fact, he had at his disposal materials that had been found during the excavations at Tel El Amana. He had everything on site. Well, you know, plaster is fairly easy to make, and it's impossible to date. And the stone it's made from is found all over Egypt. It's the country of limestone. You can use a large piece of limestone and then make it the size you need. After that, you put the plaster on, and then let the sculptor do his work and make a good copy. He had a great number of faces he could copy from authentic objects that had been found. Like this bust, an unfinished but authentic model of Nefertiti, which was also discovered in Thutmose's studio. It has traces of carbon showing what still needed to be sculpted. Did Borchardt use a model like this one found on site, which he then had painted? Borchardt is very precise in his notes from the dig. He states he found large quantities of pigments, adding they were all still quite usable. But if this was an experimental copy, how is it Borchardt never spoke of it to his team, nor in his meticulous notes? According to the historian, on the 5th of December 1912, the archaeologist was in Cairo. He learns that one of Germany's princely families is passing through and wants to visit his archaeological digs. Caught unprepared, Borchardt rushes back to Tel Al Amana. He arrives on the 6th of December 1912, which was meant to be a day off for his workers. He immediately sets them back to work. Later, he proudly shows their highnesses the fruits of his labor. In an excess of zeal, one of the dig foremen, an Egyptian called Senussi, disappears briefly during the visit, then returns with a bust of Nefertiti. 
The royals are delighted with such a masterpiece, and a photograph immortalizes the moment, leaving Borchardt apparently no time to explain it was a copy and not the real thing. Henri Sterlin claims the photo is what trapped the archaeologist. You couldn't just tell the royal visitors who are enthusing over the object, listen, you're mistaken, it's, uh, it's ridiculous. It would make a mockery of the royals. It was simply not possible to tell the truth. Or the royals might have been covered in ridicule, and that would have been les majesté, or treason, which at the time was very serious indeed and could have ruined Borchardt's career and life for good. After the royals left, the bust mysteriously disappears for almost 11 years. Borchardt reportedly gave it to his sponsor, James Simon. It was the wealthy industrialist who had financed part of his expedition to Tel El Amana. They were so excited, James, when he got the message that uh, they'd found this beautiful figure. And it was, uh, uh, I'm sure, a great anticipation here in Berlin waiting for it to come back. And the bus sat on his coffee table, you know, for almost 10 years, sitting in his home. From 1912 to 1924, Borchardt systematically refuses to show the Queen in public. At first, I didn't realize the missing eye was such an insult to her image and dignity. A one-eyed Nefertiti, definitely a crime of treason and sacrilege against the pharaonic image of the great queen of Egypt. To find out more, we visit the University of Liège in Belgium. There, Dimitri Labouri, one of the greatest specialists of the art and archaeology of ancient Egypt, gives us his expert opinion. It's a tool, like an artist's dummy, a studio model, used so the sculptor can reproduce faithful copies of the officially sanctioned image of Nefertiti that had been approved by Akhenaton, and probably Nefertiti herself. The bust and many others like it were, says Professor Labouri, communication tools. The official portrait of the Queen had to be instantly recognizable to the priests and the people in both Upper and Lower Egypt. As to the fact one eye was missing, according to the experts, that was purely another model to show the exact depth it was necessary to sculpt to correctly inlay Nefertiti's eyes. Dimitri Labouri says the royal bust was a typical studio model of the Akhenaton family style. If you look at Akhenaton's mouth, and you look at the mouths of the Armanian princesses, and you look at the mouth of Nefertiti's father-in-law, they're shaped differently, but it's in the same sensual and aesthetical manner. The key argument in favor of the bust's authenticity has, in fact, been disproved by one of Germany's best Egyptologists, Rolf Krauss. What we know is that the bust was made according to a distinct set of proportions. Not just any proportions, but those of the Egyptian finger. In Britain and the USA, the foot and the inch are used in the measuring system. The Egyptians used the finger as a point of reference. To create a new bust, Akhenaton's sculptor is believed to have first drawn up a reference grid for sculptors all across Egypt. Each line was based on the width of a finger. The bust of Nefertiti had to correspond to these measurements. Rolf Krauss also proved how certain cross-sections systematically corresponded to precise facial anatomical points the base of the nose, for example, or the mouth. In this way, the length of the face would be calibrated with the base of the chin to the headdress. She's made based on a grid of proportions calculated on the Egyptian unit of measurement of 1.875 centimeters, the Egyptian finger. She's built metrically, but the counterfeiter at the time would have had to know how to use the Egyptian centimeter and not the modern one. 
the proportional grid would have allowed standardized production of the bust of Nefertiti across Egypt. Apparently, the forgers at the start of the 19th century were not aware of this. But there's yet another anomaly that is further proof the bust is a fake. The shoulders that are cut vertically. The arms on the bust were cut vertically, and apart from some very rare exceptions, it's just not something you see in Egyptian art. Busts are cut horizontally, at the level of the shoulders, and not vertically. Is the bust of Nefertiti, with its shoulders cut vertically, the only artwork of its kind in Egyptian history? To seek an answer, it's back to Berlin's Neues Museum. The director, Frau Siefried, says there is one other example of a bust cut vertically. It's this one, also discovered by Borchardt in 1912, and part of a collection of objects that's never been put on public display. Upset at the scandal created by Stirland's book, Frau Siefried rummaged through the entire storage of the museum to find the famous bust, or at least what's left of it. Yes, it is possible to see other examples of busts with cut shoulders, vertically. This one is from the excavations at Tel El Amana. You can still see the line that shows the central axis. And you can clearly see the shoulders cut like the coloured queens. So a second bust does exist with the same cut of the shoulders. In the spat between experts, is this a sufficiently strong argument to finally prove the authenticity of Queen Nefertiti? In Berlin, the Neues Museum, in an effort to put an end to the rumor mill, once and for all has decided to submit the bust of Nefertiti to a lie detector test. Can science finally prove it's genuine? The bust has been transferred to a hospital in Berlin to undergo a scan. What Nefertiti has in her brain may finally be revealed. The first observation is the bust is made up of a limestone lump, a lump covered in plaster, a method that allowed the sculptor or counterfeiter to change certain parts of the bust. It's proof Nefertiti was altered. Here you can clearly see the shoulder viewed from behind. The white part is limestone. What you see below it in grey is plaster, put on after the sculpture was finished. It's been added to make some corrections. And what's absolutely clear from the rear view is that the right shoulder is higher than the left one. Plaster had been used to correct and reinforce the curve of the neck of the limestone Nefertiti bust. And the sculptor had even altered the cheeks and cheekbones, as well as the bridge of the nose, by adding some plaster there too. Was this the world's first facelift? But other than some evidence of plaster surgery, what do the X-rays prove? The tomography isn't definitive proof. By cutting out samples from inside the object, you cannot prove when it was made. You can only state there's a stone interior and that there's a layer of plaster that's been sculpted. But as to when, we just can't tell. I can't tell using this method that the bust is 3,300 years old. What about the plaster itself used to cover the limestone Nefertiti? Does it date from the time of Akhenaton? The Germans took a sample from the bust and had it analyzed by a chemist, a specialist in ancient Egyptian objects. Several elements were found in the sample of plaster that existed only in the Armanian period or a little earlier. They're the same as in the architecture and the masks, which means the plaster mix was an invention from that era. The composition of the plaster is typical from the Amarna period. In other words, the plaster that covers the bust of Nefertiti is indeed of the type used by Egyptians 
more than 3,000 years ago. When the bust was discovered, they had no way of knowing what constituents were in the plaster. The technology that allows such analysis wasn't developed until the 1950s. A counterfeiter would have had no way of knowing the plaster's composition. He might, though, have used plaster found during the archaeological dig in 1912. For now, though, there's no way of being sure. There's one other scientific way to test Nefertiti's authenticity. The pigments, which make the bust so vivid, imitate skin color so accurately and make the mouth so sensual. Four colors dominate art in Egypt. Blue, green, ochre, and yellow. Each dynasty's artists, however, had their own techniques to mix and use pigments. Analyzing the pigments found at Tel El Amana, can the bust be finally authenticated? The analysis of the pigments showed us that the colors were indeed those used in ancient Egypt, and that the technique of preparing the pigments were then abandoned during this period. Here too, the forger could have cheated. Because, as you may remember, Borchardt, when he discovered Nefertiti in the studio of Thutmoses, had also uncovered a treasure trove of pigments of all colors. There were yellows, reddish ochres, light ochres, and the renowned lapis lazuli blue. By the end of Akhenaton's reign, when the sculptors and artisans abandoned their studios in Tel El Amana, they took with them only the more important things. A large part of their reserves of pigments, of course, but they would have left behind quite a few. Enough pigments, maybe, to decorate a queen. So is Nefertiti real or a fake? The experts have no doubt. All the scientific and historic tests are categorical. The materials are all authentic. But there remains one issue, a contradiction, a suspicion. None of the materials with which it's made allow the bust to be dated accurately. No technology exists that can date stone sculptures. The Technicolor Queen of Eternal Youth will therefore continue to defy science for years to come and, like all the great ladies of history, conceal her age. In the early part of the 20th century, enthusiastic amateurs played at being explorers, following in the footsteps of the archaeologists. The discovery of the bust of Nefertiti by Ludwig Borchardt sparked a particular craze for all objects dating from the period of Akhenaton. Unfortunately, they were very rarely available but it meant the forgers would be kept busy. At around this time in Cairo, a certain Emil Bruch starts a lucrative business. He provides artists with genuine articles, which they then copy or use to make fakes. It's almost too easy since at the time, Bruch was in charge of the shop at the Museum of Antiquities in Cairo. For a while, the museum would allow its staff members, particularly the restorers, to take some of the objects home with them, to study them, as it were. Some of the restorers became remarkably accomplished forgers. Today, their identity is largely unknown, apart from some rare photographs, such as this 1910 image of two known counterfeiters. One is Paolo Dingley from Malta. Variously a painter, sculptor and forger, Dingley exercised his skills at home. Curiously, Ludwig Borchardt was known to visit him on a regular basis. One of Borchardt's responsibilities was to act as a buyer for museums back in Germany. In those days, forgery was a flourishing business. So it was crucial not to buy the wrong things. 
There were many forgers back then, and today it's difficult to calculate how much counterfeit stuff they produced. Yet the question remains about whether some museums are still displaying some of their fakes. And there's not one museum anywhere in the world that doesn't have forgeries. The quality of some of the fakes was exceptionally high. And there are no guarantees that even the experts wouldn't be taken in. We all have something in stock that's a fake. Fakes that, for the most part, date back to the 1920s. Modern Cairo and its 16 million inhabitants. Are there still forgers as talented as the earlier generation in the city? To get the answer, we contacted one of them. Luc Vatrin, an archaeologist and an expert on forgeries, comes with us as we head out of Cairo towards Memphis. So we're going to Memphis, which is 25 kilometers south of Cairo. It's an area that has many studios where some of Egypt's best forgers live and work. It might be risky, uh, we have to be careful, but by speaking Arabic, we should be able to win their trust fairly easily. The counterfeiters' headquarters in the Cairo suburbs is at Mitrahine, a poor area where no tourist ever goes. To establish contact with the forgers, we pretend to be buyers acting on behalf of rich collectors. Mudir doesn't have his own studio yet. He works from home. At the moment, he's working with limestone. He suggests sculpting a small pharaoh's head in less than 10 minutes. You see how fast he is. Look, look, look at the technique he's using and the points of reference he uses. The limestone he's chosen is very soft. Using a simple rasp, Moudir completes his demonstration in just a few minutes. Then he soaks the sculpture in water to make the veins in the limestone stand out. The result is convincing. One can just imagine what this young forger could achieve over two months working in granite or other type of rock copying from an original work. No, it's good. Listen, ask him whether if I bring him an original work, he could make an exact copy of it. Yes, I can copy it. No problem, I can show you something I've done already. To convince us he would make a good supplier, Moudir shows us a bust in rose granite, which he's using to sharpen his skills, and which he's copied just from a photograph. The stone Mudir is using is 3,000 years old. It would certainly fool the experts. But where does it come from? How can you get hold of stone that dates back to the time of the pharaohs? The answer lies a short distance from Mudir's house. These are the ruins of a temple that dates back to the time of Ramses II. It's not the only one, it's just part of the great temple of Path from the Ramses period. The site lies abandoned and unsupervised in the center of Mitrahine, an open-air mine for the forgers. The remains of ancient Egypt are there for the picking. In a few years, nothing will be left. Everything will have been pillaged. Just forgeries sculpted from the legs of Ramses II or in this column of hieroglyphics. These, at least, are genuine. Berlin, March 2011. 18 months after the opening of the Neues Museum. Visitors flock in their thousands to see the best ambassador Egypt has ever sent to Germany, Queen Nefertiti, the Germans' very own Mona Lisa. But on the far side of the Mediterranean, the latest success of the star exhibit at the Neues has stirred anger and renewed nationalist sentiments. 
at the end of the main gallery of Cairo's big museum. The most powerful man in the world of Egyptology has agreed to be interviewed in the hall, dedicated to the great pharaoh Akhenaton and his wife Nefertiti. He doesn't mince his words. For almost two years, we studied everything until we have a proof that the bust of Nefertiti in Berlin was taken illegally out of uh, Egypt. The bust of Nefertiti should be in this museum and not in Berlin. Did the Germans steal the bust of Nefertiti? Zahi Hawass has made a serious charge. At the start of the 20th century, the custom was that objects found during digs were equally divided between the archaeologists and the state of Egypt. But Zahi Hawass, the Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities in Egypt, says Ludwig Borchardt cheated when it came to Nefertiti. In that time, there was a protocol that anything for kings and queens to be discovered at Amarna cannot leave Egypt. In January 1913, the Egyptian authorities ask a Frenchman, Gustave Lefebvre, to ensure the equal partition of Borchardt's treasures. It was Lefebvre who decided to give Nefertiti to the Germans. Why did a Frenchman, of all people, agree to let the most beautiful statuette in Egyptian history leave for a Berlin museum? Here's the official version, according to the Germans. On the 17th of January, 1913, Gustave Lefebvre leaves Cairo for Tel El Amarna. The excavations had already ended a month before. Every object the Germans had found had been inventoried, labelled and packed, ready to leave for the museum in Berlin. Ludwig Borchardt is waiting for Lefebvre. The German is nervous, scared that the Frenchman might confiscate his prized possession, Queen Nefertiti. We know what happened that evening thanks to Bruno Gutterbock, an eyewitness to the dividing of the spoils, and one of Borchardt's colleagues. He described what happened in detail in a letter. So Gutterbock says the cases were opened and they looked through everything. I wasn't there and neither were you, so we can't say this is what really took place. But Gustave Lefebvre made his choices. On what basis did Lefebvre act? Why did he allow the Germans to take the bust of Nefertiti? According to eyewitness Gutterbock, Borchardt outmaneuvered the younger Frenchman. He knew Lefebvre wasn't interested in sculptures, but was an expert in ancient writings. To stop Lefebvre rummaging through the case in which he had packed Nefertiti, Borchardt shows him object number one he says is his principal discovery. It's a colored stone tablet portraying Akhenaton and Nefertiti and the princesses. Lefebvre seizes the chance to study the hieroglyphic inscriptions. Still, according to the witness, Borchardt produced only black and white photos of the sculptures. Busts of the princesses and, of course, that of Nefertiti. A majestic and royal portrait that it's unthinkable that Lefebvre wouldn't have realized that this object had to absolutely remain in Egypt. The scandal is revealed by Rolf Krauss. The former curator of the Egyptian Museum in Berlin decides to reveal the details of how the objects were shared. He claims Lefebvre never examined the contents of the packing cases and that he was never shown the photo of Queen Nefertiti, but another photo instead. Gutterbock wrote that Lefebvre had seen a bad photo of Nefertiti, one which showed only a part of the bust, the nose, the mouth and the eyes, but not the whole bust. And the photograph was dark, was not clear, it was not 
color like today. What Lefebvre allegedly saw then was a photo of Nefertiti without her royal headdress and necklace, resembling a princess rather than a queen. Yet Lefebvre did have the possibility of better judging the pieces by taking them out of the traveling cases. That way he would have discovered the splendid bust of Nefertiti. Then was Lefebvre in the magazine. The fair was taken towards the cases, but he never asked for the objects to be taken out. He couldn't have known that among them was such a beautiful object. Burkhardt tried his best to hide the beauty of the statue, and he took it out of Egypt illegally. Did Borchardt trick Lefebvre by showing him an incomplete photo of the queen? Who cheated? Obviously, Borchardt. <laughs> Archaeologist Rolf Krauss believes the bust of Nefertiti should be in a museum in Cairo, but definitive proof was still lacking. And we found it in this extraordinary document from 1913. It's the official list of how the finds from Borchardt's excavations of 1912 were divided, written by Gustave Lefebvre. In the left-hand column are the things selected by Lefebvre for the Cairo Museum. Object number one, the renowned painted stone tablet representing Akhenaton and Queen Nefertiti playing with their daughters. In the right-hand column, among the items on their way to Berlin, object number one is listed as a bust. But it's not of a queen, it's a bust of a royal princess made of painted plaster. Queen Nefertiti, therefore, never officially existed in the most infamous sharing out of spoils in Egypt's long history. Will she ever resume her place as queen in Egypt, leaving behind her only her royal shadow? <laughs>